This is Jarvis, a multi-axis industrial robot that I've been building here in my home shop. There's a whole series of videos explaining my progress up to this point, but today I'm gonna to focus on this middle section. This was by far the largest and most difficult part to make. I'm gonna show you how I made this, as well as talk about some of the design decisions that went into the particular layout that we have here. Oh, and check this out. Jarvis, he has a hand now. <laughs> Let's get started. The number one driving factor when designing a robot arm that's gonna do anything useful is the weight. And not just the total weight of the robot, but how that weight is distributed. I'm gonna take this cover plate off and then I'll explain what I mean. Here's a quick look on the inside from the front. And if we come around to the back, we can start with our first subject. And that is this massive motor and gearbox combination. This is a 750 watt AC servo motor. So it's about one horsepower. And the gearbox and servo motor together weigh about 14 kilograms or approximately 30 pounds. 30 pounds is a lot of weight to swing around, especially if you want your robot to move very quickly. And that's one of the reasons why the motor is down here instead of up here. Deciding how to position this motor was something I spent a lot of time thinking about. It's not a lightweight decision. And just like everything else in engineering, there are reasons to do both. If I had positioned the motor up here, I would reduce complexity by a lot. In fact, I'd be reducing the number of purchase parts. I'd be reducing the number of custom machine parts that I had to make. I'd be reducing the number of potential failure points, like possibly this belt breaking. Now I've given myself a safety factor of three with this belt, meaning it's about three times stronger than I think it needs to be but it is still a potential failure point. Even though the belt is really strong, it leads to a different type of failure. For example, if the gear was directly coupled here and a tooth broke, then it might only move a few more teeth before it stopped. But if the belt breaks, the arm will move all the way down until the exterior part of the arm literally runs into something. So again, these are all things that you wanna consider when selecting the layout of your arm. There are other issues related to the belt. It needs to be tensioned, for example. It could potentially stretch over time. And there are a whole bunch of little things to think about when designing a belt drive. One issue that you might expect to be a problem would be precision when using a belt. But actually, these belts are extremely precise. And not just this type of belt, but any type of properly tensioned tooth belt. You can look at any 3D printer and see a perfect example of extremely cheap belts and parts giving you very high precision. And that's what I have here, except this is a high-end, high-precision belt, so even more so in my application. It's worth mentioning that the belt is flexible by design. So in high-speed applications where you stop suddenly, you might actually overshoot your target as the belt stretches and then snaps back into place. Like I said, there are quite a few benefits to directly attaching this motor to this axis, but there are two huge downsides, and they're related to each other. First issue is moving all of this mass away from the center of rotation increases something called rotational inertia. Rotational inertia is basically a measure of how difficult it is to accelerate an object, that is to speed it up or slow it down. One of the best examples of this in practice is a figure skater. We've all seen figure skaters hit the ice and go into a spin where they pull their arms in closer to their body and they begin to accelerate and spin faster and faster. What they're doing is decreasing their rotational inertia. If you reverse that clip though, you can see as their arms go back out, they're increasing their rotational inertia and slowing their bodies down. The same thing is happening with my robot arm. As I move this mass away from the center and then try to accelerate the robot arm quickly, I've got a lot of rotational inertia making it difficult to move the robot arm quickly from a standstill. The second issue, which feels very similar to the first, is moving this 30 pound mass another 15 inches away from the center increases the amount of torque I need in order to actually lift the robot arm and that's independent of how quickly I try to move it from a standstill. The best example of torque is a seesaw. I tacked a few pieces of steel together and asked my kids to balance themselves out as if they were on a seesaw. It took them less than 30 seconds to figure out that if they shifted themselves closer or further away from the center, that the heavier kid could balance out the lighter kid. What they're actually doing is balancing out the torques. Torque is defined as force times distance. So if you double the distance on one side from the center, you need double the force on the other side. The same thing is happening with my robot arm, except in my case, I have the weight of the arm on one side and the force supplied by the motor 
on the other side of the pivot. If I move this weight out away from the center, I need a proportional increase in force from this motor that's trying to balance out that weight. The only way to resolve these two issues would be to increase the size of this motor here, but that has a lot of trickle down effects. If I increase the size of the motor, I also need to increase the size of the gearbox that it's attached to because more force is being sent through it. I need to increase the size of the servo drive because more electrical power is needed. I need to increase the size of all the supporting material because the weight of the motor and the physical size of the motor is heavier and larger. And as you can see, it doesn't take very long before your costs will go up through the roof. If you can afford those increases in costs, then the trade-off may be worth it. There's actually one more reason I wanted to use a belt drive here, and that is it gives me a very easy way to change the torque or speed of my robot by simply changing this pulley out. For example, if I made this one to one instead of approximately two to one, I could double the torque of my robot and give myself a much higher lifting capacity, giving up some speed. You see lots of examples of this in all types of power tools. Everything from band saws to drill presses use stepped pulleys in order to trade out speed for torque. Having the flexibility to change that pulley gives me a much wider range of applications for my robot arm from lifting very heavy objects, albeit slowly, or lifting lighter objects very quickly. Once I finalized the decision to use a belt drive, the rest of my energy went into making this section as light as possible while being just barely strong enough and rigid enough to do the task. With that in mind, let's talk about how I made this section. My initial plan was to make both sections of the arm out of square tubing, and that worked out really great for the lower portion of the arm. But once I started designing the motor mounts and the other components that will connect to the larger section, I realized it would be much lighter overall if I just thickened up the base plate and made the two outer sections out of angle iron. Given the size of this part, I decided to go ahead and make a prototype just to test the fit, form, and function before I started cutting any metal. Speaking of cutting metal, this section of the arm is much longer than the full travel I have on my bridge part. So I decided to bring it over to my wood router, but the wood router is not rigid enough to cut out all of the precise fits that I needed to cut. So the compromise was to cut out the profile here and put some locating holes then I could do this in two operations over on the bridge port. Once I got over to the bridge port, I could set my origin at the locating hole and let some of the metal hang off of the end of the table. Once I finished the first set of operations, I could clean up the table, shift everything over, set my origin at the locating hole again, and then run the second operation hanging off the other side of the table. Next, I took a short section of seven inch pipe and cut it in half. I use this to build up the two edges of my arm, essentially adding flanges. These flanges give me a lot more stiffness without increasing the weight. Once those two pieces are welded on, I could cut the angle iron to fit. The inner height here is really critical, so I'm using some one, two, three blocks and an eighth inch piece of aluminum in order to make sure I've got enough clearance on the inside before I weld all this down. Several of you asked me about this welding gun in a previous video. Essentially, this is a MIG welding gun designed specifically for aluminum. That big bulge on the end of the gun is actually the spool right there beside your hand. As much as possible, you should avoid welding after machining. But in this particular case, I had some features that were just not accessible while the angle line was in place. One of the last steps before painting this area is to trim out this curved section, which gives me more access to the bolt holes. I also think it makes it look a little bit better. Because there's no precision required here, it was a whole lot faster to cut it on the bandsaw than to cut these features on the bridge port. I did need to go back to the bridge port to add a few more features. We're gonna need some tapped holes for the cover plate. I also needed to cut out the opening in the center to its final dimensions. Nice. I opted to make this piece out of acrylic primarily because I just thought it would look a lot better and also because it was very fast to get this deep engraving this way. I could certainly make this piece out of aluminum and it would be much stronger. My intent is to go back and do exactly that if I ever break this piece.
As you can probably guess, I have disassembled and reassembled this arm many times. So this clip that you're looking at is obviously me assembling it after the robot's just about complete. Later on in the series, I intend to tell you more about my cable management system here and how all of this works to allow the robot to move the way it does. Let's plug this guy in and fire it back up. I look for every opportunity to teach my kids about math and science and all the things that I am passionate about. That's why you're constantly seeing them in the shop doing electrical work, watching me machine. These are all the things that I'm excited about, but I want them to know about all the STEAM concepts as well. And that's where KiwiCo comes in. KiwiCo makes these crates that come with all types of toys and projects based on STEAM concepts. At my house, it's a family event and we order crates based on all of our varying interests with a little bit of a twist. Because we're on subscription, we never quite know exactly what we're gonna get and we always end up trading and bartering a little bit before we start assembling our crates. One of my favorite aspects of these crates is these little guides that come inside. Of course, I also have a personal bias towards the mechanical stuff. So I'm usually looking for those engineering drawings that show the ancient versions of whatever we're putting together today. Bonus alert, I learned how to make balloon animals, which is insane, something I never thought I would enjoy doing. And here I am twisting up balloons and making all types of things with them. I love the fact that at an early age, we get to stimulate those problem solving skills, even when they're out of school. And did I mention we have a lot of fun? <laughs> So here's the deal. All you have to do is go to kiwico.com slash fielding50. That's kiwico.com slash fielding50 to get 50% off of your first month subscription. And by using that link, you'll also be supporting this YouTube channel. It is totally, totally worth it. kiwico.com slash fielding50. Now up to this point, I've troubleshooted a lot of different motor issues, but I have never had three different motors give the same error message at the same time. Well, that's interesting indeed. Okay, power's off. Oh, I gotta fix that. This is an M, and I read it as a three and plugged the motor into cable three. Let's hope that didn't damage anything. Four, five, and six are giving me an error message. I might have damaged my encoders by putting 24 volts on those lines. Oh, gosh. This is so bad. Oh. I decided I probably should take a little break here and let the dread of what I think I've done fully set in before I come back and test my hypothesis. This is motor number four. And this guy is wired as if it was that one. So if we see that shaft spinning, then we know we got it. That is definitely the problem. I have fried the encoders on all three motors here in the upper arm. This really sucks. In just a matter of a few seconds, I managed to destroy Three motors. God, it's so painful just to think about. All right, buddy, let's get to work. Hey, future Jeremy breaking in here. I was so frustrated earlier, I never quite explained what went wrong. So let me give you a quick look. The problem starts with these cables. There are four cables. Three of them are identical. 
In my defense, that was not my original plan. I originally intended to make them all different, but I was having trouble finding cable connectors that had at least 25 conductors each, but also were small enough to fit into this space. The right solution would have been to just get a bigger box, but I didn't think to do that. I decided I would just label these and uh, I would be okay. Compounding that problem, I labeled this one M, this one number two, number three, and number four. You can probably guess which ones I switched up. Three of the motors have brakes on them, electric brakes, which have to be energized in order to allow the robot to move. That's a safety feature. But I put the 24 volts on the five volt encoders and in a split second, I fried all three encoders and those motors are no good, at least as servo motors. Uh, all three of those will have to be replaced and I've already ordered two because I have one on hand. I bought that for a teaching video, but now apparently it's gonna be part of the robot. I was really hoping to show you some examples of this guy moving around, but it's become apparent that the parts are not gonna arrive in time for me to repair it and show it in this video. However, I do post a lot of updates on Twitter, Instagram, as well as on my Patreon page. And of course, if you wanna keep track of what I'm doing here, you can subscribe to the YouTube channel, click the button, also click the little bell if you want to be notified when the next video comes out. I gotta tell you, this project has been kicking my butt for months and to plug it in today when the mechanical design is done and I'm ready to focus on programming and then lose three motors, that was just a bit stressful. Anyway, I hope you'll come back and join me for the next video and thanks for watching.